Hey, Impact family, thanks for joining us as Pastor Travis leads us in a powerful and hope-filled message. If you are already, subscribe to this YouTube channel and hit that notification bell and give us a thumbs up. Make sure you leave a comment on where you're watching from. We're so glad that you're tuning in and we believe that wherever you're watching from, God will impact your life through today's message. I'm so glad y'all are here today. You guys ready to have some fun? A few of you. I know I'm hold I know I'm holding a foot. I'm well aware of the fact that I'm holding a foot, a white foot. I apologize to all of my minority brothers and sisters because I couldn't find anything other than a white foot. And I'm holding this white foot because I wanted to start this sermon off with this white foot with wiggly toes. I know, they wiggle, look, wiggle, wiggle. I know, yo is right, like that's a, but I wanted to start with the foot because I wanted y'all to know that today I came to step on some toes today. I'm about to have so much fun stepping on your toes. I know, some of you look terrified. You should be terrified. But I came to, I have a question. There's it's a sincere question. Uh, actually, before I ask this question, I want to pray. Would you, would you bow your heads with me? God, thank you for your word today. God, I pray that you'd speak to us, challenge us, change us, make us more like you. We pray this in Jesus' name. We all say amen. amen. My question is, because I've been thinking about this, does anybody, does anybody else copy? Does anybody else besides me copy the accent of somebody that you're speaking to? Come on, come on. If, you, if you're an accent copier, raise your hand. Raise your hand. Like all of a sudden you just get an accent and you don't even know why. Raise your hand. Come on, if that's you, raise your hand. Man, that's a lot. That's about half of you. How many of you, you, you don't do that? Raise your hand. You're like, yeah, I'm too cool. I don't do that. I'm way too sophisticated and disciplined. And Here's the question. Is, if, is it rude or polite? If you think it's rude, say, I think it's rude. Okay, that's not a lot of you. If you think it's polite, say, I think it's polite. I think it's polite. If you have no idea, say, I have no idea. I don't, I don't either. I don't know what it is, but I'm telling you the truth, man. Every time I'm around somebody with an accent, I get an accent right away. Like I immediately, if I start talking, if I'm talking to somebody that speaks Spanish, I turn into Mexican Travis, like right there in front of them. If I speak to somebody that has an African accent, I become an African, like really quick. If I speak to somebody that's British, oh yeah, you know it, I'm British. If I speak to somebody that's Indian, Oh yeah, I'm like, like I just become, I become Indian Travis. I don't know what it is. I'm not meaning to be rude. I feel like it's a good thing. I feel like I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm building a bridge. Like I'm like you, like we're the same. Like what? I don't know if that's, a, but that's the way I feel about it. I, I'm talking to somebody with an accent, and I immediately copy their accent. I start speaking in like a different font. <laughs> or something. <laughs> and I can change the font so fast. Like, no, let's not use that font. Let's use this font. And my wife, my wife thinks it's super rude. Oh, yeah. If I'm talking to so, And then she'll be like, why are you doing that? <laughs> and I'm like, babe, it's not rude. It's polite. As a matter of fact, I would, I would say not only is it polite, but it is something that I would call communication accommodation. Very thoughtful. I don't know why I do it, but I do it. But this got me thinking a lot about how we copy behaviors. It got me thinking about why is it easy to copy certain things in life but it's really hard and difficult to copy other things in life, right? Like, it's easy to pick up bad habits, but it's hard to put on good habits. And this is what the Bible says in Romans 12 too. I'm sure you've heard this scripture. It says, do not 
copy the behavior or the customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. This scripture is an indicator that the way you and I think by default needs to change. This scripture is saying that the world has a certain behavioral pattern. It has a certain custom that a man of God, that a woman of God should not follow. We should not copy the world, but why is it so easy to copy the world? Why is it so easy to pick up profanity? Why is it so easy? And then why is it so hard to copy the behaviors of Jesus Christ? Why is it so hard? I wanna start by having us all read a scripture together. It's 1 John 3.16. Not to be confused with John 3.16, but it kind of says the same thing. 1 John 3, 3, 16, we're gonna read it out loud together. Before we do, look at the person you came to church with and tell them right now, I better hear you read this scripture. Come on, tell somebody, I better hear you. Here we go. 1 John 3, 16. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. Today, I'm gonna preach a message that I have titled, Lay It Down. Would you say that out loud? Lay it down. Look at somebody and say, lay it down. Look at somebody you don't know and tell them, you definitely better lay it down. I don't even know you, but you got to lay it down down. I think this scripture is pretty impressive, man. I mean, it's pretty much all impressive, but this scripture is very impressive. You know why he says, this is, he says, this is how you know what love is. How do you know what love is? This is how you know. Because we live in a confused version of love in the world that we live in. Love is not lust. Love is not a feeling. Love is not emotion. You can't, you know, you can't actually fall in love. We say that, oh, I fell in love. You didn't fall in love. If you could fall in love, you could fall out of love. Like, whoops, I fell right back out of love. Like, that was crazy. Love is not a feeling. Love is not an emotion. Love is so deep that it is a commitment that requires you to lay your life down. Most people want to get married. Most singles want to get married someday because of what they think it will do for them. But marriage, hear me, all you single people, marriage is about what you are going to do for them. Marriage is about laying your life down. Commitment is about laying your life down, your desires, your wants, your needs, your selflessness, it becomes surrendered. So how do we know what true love is? By laying one's life down. This is the single most difficult concept of something that you need to copy in your life. This is the most difficult concept that you'll ever have to copy from Jesus Christ, laying down your life, because it means that you have to surrender all to him. Why? Because it will cost you, every, listen to me, it is going to cost you everything you've got. It is going to require you to surrender everything about yourself. That's what love is. Jesus said one day he was asked, Jesus, what is the greatest commandment in the law? Remember in Jewish law, there were over 600 
commands, 600 laws. They said, Jesus, what's the greatest one? And he said, love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. My question is, if that is the greatest commandment, love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, and mind, here's my question, how do you do that? Because I think most Christians in 2024 think it's about what you say and not what you show. They think it's about lip service and not life service. How do you know? How do you know what love is by laying my life down? How do you love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, and mind? You do what Jesus did. You copy him. You lay down your life for him. This is how we know what love is because love is surrender. Love is give, 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 not get, get, get. See, lust is about getting and about getting it right now. But love is about waiting and it is about giving. That's the difference between love and lust. And so Jesus said this, he said, he said in the book of John, he said, if you love me, what does he say? Obey my commands. He doesn't say, if you love me, just say you love me. Are you with me? Because it's going to take off like a rocket. You're going to be like, oh my, this is your warning to just leave right now. Because it's going to get, it's going to get crazy here in a minute. Because it needs to get crazy here in a minute. He says, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. So I came, I came today to step on some toes. I came to step on some toes. You know why I came to step on some toes? Because I'm tired of this wishy-washy, watered-down version of American Christianity that I'm watching and witnessing all over the U.S. in the year of 2024. I I'm tired of it, so I came to step on some toes, and God gave me a word this week for my church family. And this word is for you. I almost named and titled the sermon what I'm about to tell you. But this is the word, is that many of you today are surrounded but not surrendered. The word for you is that you're surrounded but not surrendered. I'm surrounded by God's people. I'm surrounded by God. I'm surrounded by God's word. I'm surrounded by men of God, women of God. I go to church, PT. I'm surrounded by God. I'm surrounded by people that love Jesus, but I'm not surrendered. I'm not surrendered. And God wants you to move out of your surroundings and move into a surrendering, a surrendering of your life. That's my prayer for you today, is that you surrender your heart, your soul, and your mind. That you surrender your life, that you, that you lay it down. Listen, I know I'm preaching to some of you today, and, and, and surrounded, but not surrendered. And I can tell you, in my own life, I have lived that. I could write a book on being surrounded, but not surrendered. Because that was me at one point in my life. I was surrounded by God, but not surrendered to God. I was surrounded, my mother, my mother, oh man, woman of God. When I was not a Christian in my teen years, my mother was a woman of God, Impact Church. I'm talking about a Holy Ghost walking, tongue talking, powerhouse woman of God. My mama's a woman of God. She's a woman. And I was surrounded, but not surrendered. My grandma, I, I, woman of God, surrounded, but not surrendered. You guys, I went to something called Young Life every week. Oh, yeah, Young Life's where they basically have church in a house, and they play kumbaya, y'all, and they preach the sermon to you. I went to Young Life. I went for the girls. 
not God. You know what I've learned? God will use anything he can to get you into a surrender. He wants you to surrender. Some of you came today with that cute girl. Hey, he's going to get you. He's coming after you. He's running after you. If he offer you some little cutie in Scottsdale, Arizona, to get you to come to church and into the presence of God, he will. I'm so thankful God never stopped chasing me. I'm so thankful. I remember this one time. I was sitting in my truck. I'm about 17 years old. And I'm at the park. And I got my windows up. And I got subwoofers. Because every teenager, you got to bang, dude. You got to get that 808. And I'm just in my own world bumping that by NWA. And I'm just like, dude, probably listening to something I shouldn't have been. This street preacher walks up to my door window. I didn't know he was a street preacher. And he's just staring in my window going like this. That's weird. Full grown man, minor. That's weird. And he's waving. So I did what every good citizen would do. And I rolled, I rolled, how many of you are old enough to remember? I rolled down my window. Anybody remember those days? I rolled down my window, baby. Generation today has no idea. They're like, Feet. and by the way, the next generation is going to be crazy. All they're going to be like, think it, like down window. It's getting wild. I rolled down the window and the guy goes, hey, I have a question for you. Are you a Christian? And I said, yeah. And he said, how do you know? And then I became very conflicted. <laughs> I said, well, because my mom <laughs> might be related to Jesus. <laughs> She's that close to him. Like, I can't get away with anything at home without my mom knowing because God revealed it to her again <laughs> during her quiet time. So, yes, I'm a Christian. <laughs> My grandmama, she loved Jesus. She's a Christian. Too. And by the way, I've been to their church. It's crazy. And then he started to share. Man, he's super cool. He's like, you know, that's, that's, that's great, man, that you family and church and like all that. So he's like, but man, it's about a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's about surrendering your, it's not about knowing about God, knowing about Jesus. It's about knowing Jesus. There's a big difference between knowing about Jesus and knowing Jesus. This is what God is saying, is that some of you are surrounded, but you're not surrendered. You're surrounded, not surrendered, right? I, I, I'm, I'm a I'm a Christian, but are, but are you a Christian? Because Jesus said this, and this is actually frightening. And when I mean frightening, like sobering, Jesus said, not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who, What? Yeah, yeah. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. And on judgment day, many will come to me and say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not perform many miracles in your name? But I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's laws. This is crazy, family. I never knew you. Well, Jesus, I, 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 did, I went to Impact Church. Yeah, but I never knew you. Jesus, I, I had a Bible in my house on the coffee table. I never knew you. Jesus, but my mama, yeah, I know your mama. But I never knew you. He's saying, not everybody that says, Lord, you can prophesy in my name. 
You can cast demons out in my name. You can use the, the luxury of my name, but you don't know me, and I don't know you. And that's the difference, see, because the danger is is that you can be inside of the church but not have Jesus inside of you. And that's a dangerous place to be. The danger is that you can become a church goer but not a disciple. Y'all with me? Is this too hard? Because I can save it for the fourth service. Because so many people associate themselves with Christianity because, like, it's cool, you know, it's like, man, I'm a Christian, but you're not a Jesus follower. You're not a disciple. You, you, you're not a cross bearer. Some people like to wear crosses, you know? You got a pretty little cross hanging on your neck, so cute, so pretty. You got a handsome cross hanging on your neck, super handsome man, fly. You a fly guy. And I just want to make sure that everybody understands in Impact Church that there is a big difference between putting on a cross and taking up your cross. There's a big difference because Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, what does he say? Let him deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? This is intense. Like, Jesus never said, Jesus never said, hear me, Jesus never said, Become a Christian. Never. He never said that. He said, follow me. Deny yourself. Take up your cross. Follow me. Deny yourself. Take up your cross. See, the danger is that you become a consumer Christian, but not a disciple of Jesus Christ not a Jesus follower. He said, follow me, deny yourself, take up your cross. He didn't say become a Christian. He said, follow me, deny yourself, take up your cross. And then as people followed him, denied their selves and took up their cross, then everybody else started calling them Christians. See, there's a difference. I wonder if people that know you would call you a Christian. I wonder if you call yourself Christian, but people that know you wouldn't even know that you're a Christian. He's saying, take up your cross, man. It's about laying down your life. See, sadly, too many churchgoers around the world, too many churchgoers, in Arizona, too many churchgoers in Scottsdale, Arizona, too many churchgoers, even at Impact Church, they have taken up consumerism instead of taking up their crosses. I'm gonna talk about consumerism because this makes me happy. I've been wanting to do this for a long time. I've been wanting to step on toes for a long time because it just seemed like a bunch of weak sauce Christians across the world. It just seems like a bunch of, it just seems like consumer Christianity. Consumer Christianity is, God, what are you going to do for me today? Hello? Consumer Christianity is, I'm walking through the Jesus Mall I'm like, God, I like one of those. God, I like one of those. God, I like one of those. I wake up tomorrow. God, give me some joy. Give me some peace. God, give me, give me some, 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 some peace over my fear and my anxiety. And God, help me help my marriage. And God, heal my body. And God, help me in my finances. And God, hey, give me your favor. I want your favor, God. And will you do this for me? And we do that for me? And we do everything else for me? God, do every, literally do it all for me. Yeah. I'm not going to do much for you. 
consumer Christianity. Consumer Christians are, hear me, surrounded but not surrendered. Consumer Christians are surrounded but not surrender. You say, ah, I love God, PT. I love Jesus. And I would respond with the one word question. Really? Really? Because you don't even go to church regularly. Oh, I love Jesus. I'm a Christian. You should see this tattoo I got on my back. It says, Jesus. <laughs> Some of you need to stop tattooing Jesus on your body and start tattooing Jesus on your heart. You need Jesus in your heart. You need Jesus in your soul, in your life, where you surrender. You need to move from surrender. You need to move from pretender to surrender. You need to move from pretender to surrender. There's no power in pretending. The power is in surrendering. That's where we get our power from. When I'm all in for Jesus Christ, you say it, you say it. I know I love God, but man, I don't know. Because the Bible says this is how we know. This is how we know. Ephesians calls, Ephesians, the book of Ephesians calls the church the bride of Christ. Yeah, stay with me for just a second. The bride of Christ. That's a big deal. That's you and me. We are the bride of Christ. But can you imagine getting married? I gave my life to Jesus. I surrendered all. You know, the average churchgoer in the United States of America, statistics say the average churchgoer goes to church one time a month. One time a month. I'm a Christian. I die for him. Laid it all down 12 times a year. And, and, and Ephesians calls the, the, the church us the bride. We're, we're his bride. But can you imagine getting married? <laughs> And you come home once a month on Sunday morning for an, oh, about an hour and 15 minutes. And you're like, hey, baby, it's been a month. What you got for baby today? What you got for your daddy today? What you got for me? What you got for me? What you gonna give to me? What you gonna give to me? I'll be back in a month. Is literally the church in the United States of America saying, I'm a consumer. I'm a taker. I don't do anything for God, but man, I, I sure hope he does for me. I don't do anything, but I sure hope he does for me. See, consumer Christianity, listen, I know I'm stepping on toast. I know I am. I'm doing it on purpose. I really am. Consumer Christianity is I'm going to go sit inside of Impact Church, and I'm going to have PT, fill me up. PT, I need a word. I need a word. But you're not going to serve the church. You're not going to get involved. You're not going to do anything to help me build this church. You're just going to show up and sit there. <laughs> I told you I was coming. If this is your first time, I want to apologize. I'm not always like this. I'm mostly like this, but not always. Consumer Christianity is like, God bless my finances, bless my investments. I'm not going to give you 10%. That's not happening. But God, you know my heart, I would. No, you wouldn't. You literally would not. You know how, I, listen, I've been in ministry, full-time ministry for 31 years. 31 years, that's a long time. That's a long run. But after 31 years, you hear it all, I think. I'm open to new hears. <laughs> Wait, so God wants me to tie 10% of my income back to him? Yeah. Oh, does he want me to tithe off my gross or my net? 
let's just think of all the ways we can shortcut God because we're inherently selfish and fearful. I've heard, I said, well, I can't afford to tithe. Hey, yeah, oh, the old Southern preacher, you can't afford not to, boy. <laughs> Which is true, I do like that. But the reality is you can't afford to tithe. It's almost like time. I don't have time. You have time for what you have time for. You have money for what you have money for. You have income and you have a tithe, but you, cho you chose, you chose, you chose that hefty house payment. You chose that hefty rent payment. You chose that hefty car payment. You chose that cell phone. You chose. But I love God. <laughs> Baby, baby's amen to me. That's how a baby amens. And, it, and baby even said, yeah, like that. I was like, amen, <laughs> yeah. That was pretty cool. Like literally perfect timing. Consumer Christianity is, well, by the way, this is fun for me. I'm having a great time. If you were wondering... I'm having a lot of fun with this sermon. <laughs> Consumer Christianity is I go to lots of church. I go to several churches. <laughs> I know some of you are like confused, but I'm just telling you, there are a lot of people in this world. So I go to several churches. I go to Impact Church on Sunday. I go to Trinity Church on Saturday. I go to Church for the Nations on Wednesday. I go to CCV on Friday. I go to Scottsdale Bible on Monday morning. I this, I that, and PT. Look how, what a wonderful man, a woman of God I am. I go to church all the time. It's called consumerism. By the way, most of the pastors in this area, we all know each other. Like, we're friends. We talk. <laughs> and I'm, I'm just telling you right now, there's not one pastor that would disagree with what I'm about to say right here. There's not one pastor that I know that would agree with the approach of, well, I go to different churches. And the reason why is because number one, that's a consumer Christian. We don't agree with that approach because, because we would rather you pick a church and plug in, baby. Pick a church and get involved and start serving and start building and lay down your life for the bride of Christ. Now, I go here, I get filled. Oh, there's a relationship series at this church. Fill me. Oh, there's, there's one on addiction over here. Fill me. Get freaking involved and start building the church. I know next week there's gonna be 82 of you to go to a different church. I'm okay with that. We need the parking. <laughs> but whatever church you go to, promise me you'll plug in and start helping that church build. Start, stop being a consumer and start being a cross bearer. Start being a disciple of Jesus Christ. Start laying it all down for Jesus Christ. This is what scripture teaches us. Some of y'all, you know about the Dead Sea, right? The Dead Sea? Because the Dead Sea, everything in the Dead Sea is? <laughs> Go figure that one. Dead. Like, who were the indigenous folk that goes, I got a name, I got a name, I got a name? Dead Sea. <laughs> but it's the Dead Sea. Nothing can live in it. No fish can live in it. No plant life can live in it. No algae, no bacteria, nothing can live in it. Does anybody know why? A river runs into the Dead Sea, the Jordan River. It has fresh water running in but nothing running out. Therefore, it creates the salinity and too much salt to where nothing can live in it. There's a lot of Christians in 2024 that are Dead Sea Christians. They're self-absorbed and they want the river running in, but they don't want to let the river run out. I've got this 
I got this coconut up here. Some of you have heard me share this illustration before. I just, I had to do it again because it's a coconut. I said it in a monkey accent. <laughs> coconut, 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 ooh, 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 co coconut. And there's this illustration, but it's a true one. It's a real life one, how indigenous trappers trap monkeys. You know what I'm saying? They trap monkeys. And what they do is they, 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 they tie a, a rope or a string to like one end of the coconut and they, they, hollow, they hollow out a hole in the coconut and, and then they put, they, they put some candy in the coconut and, and then what, hap what happens is then they, they, they just set it out there like that and, and the trapper goes and, and takes the one side of the string and just hides and waits. And because monkeys are super inquisitive and curious and susceptible to temptation, look at somebody and tell them, that sounds a lot like you. Tell somebody, come on, sounds a lot like you. Susceptible to temptation. They're like, oh, 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 oh man, I know that's probably gonna trap me. But oh, Hershey's, Hershey's, Kit Kat, Hershey's. Some of you men that are married, and there's a coconut at work. Hershey's. <laughs> and it's a trap. And you know it's a trap. You know it's going to ruin your life, your wife's life, your children's life. You don't care because you're so curious and you're so tempted. Some of you right now, I'm talking to you. You're not being faithful to your spouse. I'm talking to you. I think you should stand up right now. <laughs> no? Okay. And then the monkey puts its little monkey hand in the coconut, and then it grabs all the, the candy, and it's trapped because it won't let go. Because if I would just open up my hand, I could pull it back out, but because I'm clenching a fist and won't let go, I'm trapped. Isn't this the story of humanity? Like I'm trapped because I won't let go. I'm trapped in my fears because I won't let go. I'm trapped in my guilt because I won't let go. I'm trapped in my anxiety or my depression. I'm trapped in my lust. I'm trapped in my greed. I'm trapped because I, somebody say I, I, the devil didn't make you do it. It is I did it. I did it. It's my own tempt, my own desire. In fact, that's what it says in James chapter one. It says that we are tempted by our own desires that drag us off and trap us. Let's read this out loud together. Ready? Here we go. We are tempted by our own desires that drag us off and trap us. That's crazy. So our own desires become our most dangerous traps. There are countless things that we hold on to that trap us. We hold on to painful memories. We hold on to heartbreak. We hold on to unforgiveness. We hold on to grudges. We hold on to toxic relationships. We hold on to abusive relationships we hold on to these addictions and we don't even we don't even try it's not the devil the devil took the day off man it's our own desires and then other times we blame God don't we God why would you allow God get me out of this God's like you got yourself into that have you ever got yourself into something? You're like, God, please get me out of this. Raise your hand. Come on, I've done this. You're like, you're like God, if you get me out of this, I will never. 
And then like the 408th time, you're like, seriously, I know it's 408, but I will never. That's how stupid we are. You guys good? <laughs> you blame God, but he's not answering my prayers. He won't get me out of this. I'm trapped. This is not God's fault. It's not the devil's fault. It's our fault. It's my fault. It's your fault. You're the one that's not letting go. You're the one that's not laying it down. We could be free if we would just let go. We could be free if we'd just lay it down. We could find not only freedom, but we could find life. Yeah, if we'd just lay it down. Because remember what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10. He said, if you cling to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life, you will find it. I don't know if you remember this story. Does anybody remember this story in Exodus chapter 4? It's about Moses and the, he had a staff. Right? Remember the story in Exodus chapter four and, and, Moses, and Moses has got this staff in his hand and, and then God says, Moses, what's in your hand? By the way, anytime God asks a question, he already knows the answer. Like he knows. You're not, he's not like, wonder what that is. When God asks a question, he's trying to get your attention. He's trying to get you to ponder, to consider something because he's trying to do something in you. Moses, what's in your hand? And Moses says, a staff. And what does God say? He says, throw it down. Uh, my, my friend, I have a long time friend, mentor. He's one of my mentors. He's one of my, my pastors. I, I consider him to be one of my pastors. And Maybe you've heard of this guy. Some of you have, but his name is Pastor Rick Warren. He wrote a book called The Purpose Driven Life, which was like the best-selling book in the United States of America year after year after year after year after year after year after year, after year next to the Holy Bible. By the way, the Holy Bible is still the best number one selling book in America. Even with the Bible app and all the free Bible, even though it's still the number one selling book. But Rick, Pastor Rick, uh, I, was in, uh, I was in Denver in 2004 with Natalie, my wife, and we were at the NBA All-Star Game and events at the Pepsi Center, and we were staying in a hotel across the street, and Pastor Rick came to preach to us chaplains. And he was talking about this story and he said, he said, Moses' staff represented who he was. That staff represented Moses' identity, his influence, and his income. Moses' identity was, I'm a shepherd. Moses' influence was, I'm a shepherd. Moses' income was, I'm a shepherd. And God says, Moses, what's in your hand? He's asking, who are you? It's everything about who you are. Throw it down. And we know the Bible says when he throws the staff down, it becomes a snake. Pastor Rick said it like this. When he threw it down, it became alive. And then God said, pick it back up. And it became dead again. And he said to the chaplains that day, and I'm saying to you today, what's in your hand? Because if you throw it down, I am here to tell you 
that you are going to watch it become alive in your life today. It is going to come to life if you take your identity, your influence, and your income, and you throw it down. And then, you know, sometimes you hear a preacher preach something, and you're like, I don't even know if that's his original material. I mean, Rick is a legend, truly. But is that his material? And I wanted to give credit, so I actually texted, I texted Rick on Friday. So I, I have it up right here. I, I just wanted to show you guys, because on Friday, I wanted to use it. So I said, I said, um, this is all, I didn't even say hi or anything. I just said, I just said, Moses, colon, identity, income, influence. Is that your original material? Because I'm going to include it this Sunday, and I will mention you. His response, yes, it is original from me. I have preached it at least 50 times different graduations, and I've heard other preachers preach it to now. And I said, got you. I'm going to give you love for it because it is fire. And he said, you tell them that I told you to preach it. So Impact Church, I came to preach to you today. If you will take, really take, truly take your life and throw it at the feet of the cross, you will find true life in Jesus' name. If you take your identity and your influence and your income, I'm here to tell you, if you throw it down at the feet of Jesus, you will see it come alive. What I'm trying to say, is anybody in Impact Church today here ready to say, I'm ready to give everything to Jesus Christ. I'm ready to surrender all I'm ready to lay it all down. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Because I just, I'm just, I'm just, I'm, I'm frustrated. I gave my life for this thing. And then people go to church once a month, go to a different church once a month. I'm okay if half this place empties out. I want some people that are on fire for Jesus Christ. I want some people that are bold as lions for Jesus Christ. I want some people that are going to help me make disciples, not come watch me make disciples. So what's in your hand? Look at somebody and ask them, what's in your hand? Look at somebody. Tell them, what's in your hand? What's in your hand? Tell them, you should probably throw that down. You should probably throw that down. It's not that easy, is it, sometimes to just lay it down? It's just not. Sometimes it's just like I can't. I I don't want to. But it's it's just not not that easy. And it reminds me of this this book of Acts chapter 28. This is crazy. It's the book of Acts chapter 28. Paul, the apostle Paul, in the last chapter of Acts, He's out gathering some wood, making a fire. When a poisonous snake bit him on the hand. I want to read to you verse 3. It says, Paul gathered a pile of brushwood. Brushwood. Did I say that right? I said brushwood. I went all country. And that's the thing. My accents, they don't stop. I can be country. I can be hood. I can be all of it. Within the same conversation, uh, uh, Paul gathered a pile of brushwood. And as he put it on the fire, a viper driven out by the heat fastened itself onto his hand. Hey, that's a crazy word right there. The snake fastened itself onto his hand. Verse 5 says, but Paul shook He shook the snake off into the fire and suffered no effects. He he shook it off. Listen, listen, listen. There are some poisonous things in your life that are going to try to fasten themselves to you. Some poisonous relationships, some poisonous mindsets, some poisonous mentalities, some poisonous addictions. There are poisonous snakes in your life that they are going to sliver into your life and try to fasten themselves to you remember the devil appeared to Eve as a snake but it wasn't something that was scary to Eve because it looked like it belonged in the garden 
It was just another garden creature. There are some snakes in your life that are about to strike and poison you and you have no idea because it looks like it belongs in your life. And you need to have discernment and you need to pray for God's protection on your life. It said, he wasn't afraid of this. I don't know about you, I don't like no snakes. I trip. She wasn't tripping. I'm tripping. Eve wasn't tripping because it looked like it belonged. Listen, Impact Church, as I close this thing out today, what I'm trying to say is that there are some snakes in your life that look like they belong, but that is a snake that is waiting to poison you. There are some ways of thinking. There are some customs of this world. There are some behaviors of this world, but you ain't tripping because you think it belongs there. It's disguised itself. It looks normal, and you might, you might, might have already even been bitten and if you don't start shaking that thing off your life it's gonna poison you and it's gonna poison your mind and it's gonna poison your heart and it's gonna poison your soul and it's gonna poison your body and it's gonna poison your marriage and it's gonna poison your children and the reality is it's gonna poison generations to come if you don't shake that thing off. Look at somebody and tell them you need to shake that thing off because some things need a little bit extra effort. Some things need to be shaken off. You know, there's something about shaking in the Bible. The Bible says when Jesus is crucified that the ground began to shake. The Bible said when Jesus resurrected that the ground began to shake. And if you want to see some things come back to life, you're going to see a shaking. You're going to see a shaking. And I think God's shaking some of you spiritually right now. Now I'm ready to pray. Would you bow your heads with me and close your eyes? Because I think God is shaking. God is shaking. Some of you, God's been shaking you spiritually even before today. You know why he shakes you? Because he wants to bring you to life. Paul and Silas got thrown into jail in the book of Acts chapter 16 for doing nothing but preaching the gospel, wrongly arrested, falsely accused. Paul and Silas are in prison. And the Bible says about midnight, they began to pray and praise and sing to God. Whew. And then the Bible says the earth began to shake and the ground began to quake. And the Bible says that it began to shake so hard that the prison doors of every prisoner in there, it flew open and the chains were broke open. See, God wants to shake you today because he wants you to be free. If you're here today and you say, PT, man, you're talking to me. God's been shaking me. PT, you're talking to me. I've been surrounded but not surrendered. God, you're talking to me. I need to lay some stuff down. Man, I've been trying to hold on to this. I've been clenching my fists, and God is telling me to let go. Listen, this is your moment right now is to say, God, I'm letting it go. God, I'm letting it go. I'm surrendering. I'm surrendering my marriage to you, Father. I'm surrendering my wife to you, Jesus. I'm surrendering my husband. I'm surrendering my health to you. God, I'm surrendering my fear. I'm surrendering my guilt my shame. I'm surrendering this failure. God, I've blown it. I've blown it. I've failed. I've failed, God. I surrender it. I lay it down at your feet, and I beg forgiveness. God, I surrender my child. My child. I surrender my child to you. I trust you with my child, with my child's future. With my child's salvation. I trust you with my child's addiction. I trust you with my child's deception. I trust you with my broken heart. I trust you with this burden. And God, I surrender it, every bit of it, every bit of it, every bit of it. I trust you with my future. I trust you with my finances. God, I'm gonna be a tither. I'm gonna be a soldier for Jesus Christ. I'm gonna help build the church. I'm gonna be a cross bearer, not a consumer. Listen, if you're here today, 
Maybe you've, nev maybe you've never surrendered your life to Jesus Christ. I wanna talk to you for a minute. You've never, you're not a Christian. You don't know if you're a Christian today. Just like me sitting in that truck that one day, I said, man, you know what? I don't know, I've been around it. It is just not in me. Today, that's you. Man, you're surrounded but not surrendered. You say, PT, I wanna give my life to Jesus Christ right here, right now. I want you to raise your hand. Would you raise your hand? Come on, raise your hand, raise your hand, raise your hand. I wanna give my life right now to Jesus Christ. Hands everywhere, hands everywhere, hands everywhere. I'm so proud of you guys. Jesus, today, we surrender. Come on, say it with your own mouth. Jesus, today, I surrender. Jesus, I surrender. Come on, say it out loud. Jesus, I surrender. I give you my life. Thank you for giving me yours. I want to live for you. Thank you for dying for me. God, thank you for grace, mercy that is new every morning. Thank you, God, for your love that is unconditional. Thank you for creating me as a brand new creation in Christ Jesus. God, I want to become a disciple. I want to dig in. I want to eat. I want to eat. I want to eat. I want to dig into the Word of God. My manna, my daily bread, I need it. I'm starving for it. The Bible says, they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, they shall be filled. God, give us a hunger and a thirst for righteousness. God, I pray your love, your protection upon everybody here today as we surrender, as we surrender.